All right, welcome. Uh, Ryan Hoger with TEC, and I am joined by Pete Wessel with Ecobee. He's going to do all the hard stuff today, and I'm just going to be your moderator, which is beautiful <laughs> for me. So if you guys have questions as Pete's going, uh, type them in the question box, and as long as they're not stupid or related to unrelated things, then I will read them off to him, and we'll make him answer them. So with that, I'm going to turn the whole thing over to Pete. Great. Thank you very much, Ryan. Um, so yeah, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is Pete Wessel from Ecobee. I'm the regional sales manager for the Midwest region. Uh, so covering multiple states, 13 different states in the Midwest, uh, but based in Chicago. So I, I probably know a lot of you on the on the line already. Um, for the for those that we you know haven't had a chance to meet yet, we'll uh, we'll make sure to get my contact information sent out. Um, I think as far as you know some of the housekeeping things with our training and, and our presentation. Uh, we usually come and we do these live and we've got training boards where you can change the wiring configuration and power them up and everything. So obviously can't do that remotely. Um, what I would ask is ask any questions that come up. You know, we can get into some of the technical stuff. Um, the the slide deck I put together does not have all the detailed wiring and setup uh, installation information, but we can run through um, kind of a setup towards the end of the of the training. And again, any questions, just uh, just ask, and we're happy to take the time to answer. So, without further ado, um, kind of get rolling here. So, uh, one of the things we offer, you know, whether it's a live training or or be a webinar now, we're we're learning now with webinars. We've uh, we've done a few of these, and uh, what I'm learning is we can still we can still get a lot done over um, you know over a webinar remotely. So it's it's great. Um, we can offer you guys Nate hours. So anyone that needs Nate CEUs, this training will qualify for two CEUs. Uh, all we need is your Nate ID and first name, last name. Uh, I think Ryan already has a list of everybody that registered, uh, but if you if you didn't put that information in at the beginning when you registered, you can always send me an email. It's peter.w at ecob.com and just give me your name and Nate, Nate ID and we'll we'll have that submitted. So I'll kind of pause every uh, every few minutes for questions and then Ryan will just read them, um, read those questions off as, as they pop up. So, so here's what we're going to go through. Um, we're going to kind of go through our company background a little bit for those of you that aren't real familiar with Ecobee and you know where we came from and what we do. I'll explain some of that. Uh, we talk a lot about our sensors, probably spend the most time explaining how the sensors work and what you can do with them. Um, you know, from a home automation standpoint, from a comfort standpoint, from an energy saving standpoint, we'll kind of get into the, the nitty gritty on all of that. Uh, that's probably where we get the most questions from customers. And our sensors are actually our highest rated product. So um, Eco Plus and, and our homes. So these are new features that are built into the software. So I wanted to make sure and include some, some things that are new as far as um, products and services that we're rolling out. So um, any questions, please ask. Hopefully this is helpful. Uh, some of the stuff that we're going to present has never been um, included in our training prior. So um, so really really excited to, to roll out some of these new programs. Um, we'll go over the contractor portal, which we call Home IQ on the residential side. For you uh, pros out there, you, you can use that uh, same, same portal information to, to monitor customer's thermostats remotely. Uh, and then we'll kind of go over the features and benefits, some of the smart home stuff, which is usually interesting. Um, and then we'll, we'll go through like a quick install and kind of talk about all the accessories that are included in the box. And finally, uh, I just planned on touching on our Smart Buildings platform. So Smart Buildings is um, relatively new cloud-based platform that we rolled out a couple of years ago. And um, it's, it's really gonna come into play for those companies that, that have multiple thermostats, like let's say 20 plus thermostats out there that they're looking for sort of an enterprise solution um, to, to control all of those from one account. So we'll talk a little bit about that towards the end as well. So um, a history of first, we've, we've had a few iterations of this slide. We always show this slide. Um, it's ROA of 
kind of bragging a little bit, I guess, if you will, uh, as far as what um, what Ecobee has done over the last decade. Um, a lot of people don't recognize the brand Ecobee like they do some of our competitors. You know, um, we get a lot of questions about how we compare to Nest, how we compare to Honeywell. Uh, we are definitely um, one of the big players out there as far as smart thermostats on the market. Uh, the, the company was founded in 2007 and the very first model didn't roll out till 09. So one thing we always want to mention is that we were in fact the, the very first Wi-Fi smart stat out on the market. Um, so about 10, 11 years ago now, 2009, that first uh, smart model was was the one to to hit the market, uh, and we've done a lot ever since then. Um, so as far as commercial controls, we've had a few different commercial models that we've manufactured. Uh, we were the first in the market to to offer home IQ, which is what you know we refer to as like the home homeowner runtime reporting. So for both the contractor and the homeowner, we offer full visibility as far as data um, with their HVAC equipment, every time the fan kicks on, every time, um, you know, if there's an accessory hooked up, it'll it'll show your runtime for a humidifier, temperatures, indoor, outdoor, shows a lot of different information in there. Um, so we're always, uh, we take pride in being very open and transparent with with data that we share. Um, we were also the first to, to use room sensors. So the Ecobee, the little white sensors that a lot of you have probably seen um, our first gen with this, the smart sensor or the um, broom sensor, I'm sorry, was the first generation that rolled out in 2014. And now we're on our second gen, the smart sensor. Um, they're always going to be monitoring for people and they're going to be telling you the temperature in the space that they're, that they're located. So, so they're looking for an infrared body heat and they're looking for a motion read. And then they're also going to tell you the room temperature. So kind of a security sensor with a temperature sensor built into it. And then a few years ago, we uh, we came out with the Ecobee 4. It was the, uh, the first, and we remain the only one on the market with a smart speaker integrated right into the thermostat. So it has that Amazon Echo functionality built right in. It's got an Echo Dot in the thermostat. Uh, it's the only one that you can talk to, that you can play music on. It'll give you uh, news updates. It'll It'll tell you what's going on with the coronavirus right now. It'll tell you everything. Uh, so anything that an Amazon Echo will do, um, the Ecobee 4 and now the Ecobee Smart Thermostat Pro is the successor. They both have that functionality. Uh, the Smart Thermostat Pro is really um, what most people are calling the 5. So the, um, the, the 4 superseded to the Smart Thermostat Pro. And, and we'll get into some of the differences there. And then I already mentioned smart buildings. Um, so a couple of things that are coming next. You know, we've got some some new gadgets coming out uh, as far as security monitoring goes that you guys will be seeing here in the next week or so, which is really exciting. Um, and then we've got some other things down the line that, that we're working on. So any questions so far, Ryan? Uh, we did have one question. Um, it's completely uh, off of the part you're on now, but I'll ask it anyway. Uh, Michael asks, wondering if they ever came out with a part number for a back plate when installing this on a horizontal switch plate. <clears throat> Yes, uh, so good news. It's uh, one of the slides later in the presentation, so I'll cover that, Michael. Um, we don't quite have stock out there yet, but we do have a part number, we do have an accessory. Uh, TEC will carry these and um, give it another month or so, and you will uh, you should be able to start getting those. Awesome. I was expecting you to say yeah. no. But this is your answer. Yeah, I know you. I, I almost typed <laughs> no back to Michael, just like I was just saying no, but I'm like, yeah, let's just put the pressure on Pete. Awesome. The last two years, the answer would have been no, just wait. But uh, we're finally about there. Yeah. Uh, while, while we while we're asking, um, uh, Damon is asking if it's uh, Apple HomeKit compatible. Yes, um, our thermostats are HomeKit compatible. In fact, they are the preferred Apple HomeKit smart stat on the market. So. Um, Obviously, Apple's not going to sell a product with it with an Amazon speaker in it at their locations. But if you do go into, you know, the Apple stores, you'll see our, our three light model on the shelf. But both of them will will work uh, with HomeKit. No problem. Awesome. All right. One last one. And I'll let you back on track. Uh, Robert asks, uh, can you reveal any info on new products? 
Um, I, I can't officially show you guys much today, but I can explain what's next. Um, so in the next week or so, like I mentioned, we'll be rolling out um, and due to COVID-19, it's kind of changed uh, the marketing launch a lot. But um, since most retail stores are closed right now, we are, uh, we are gonna be rolling it out online initially and it will be a camera and it will be um, contact sensors that you can pair either through the thermostat or through the camera. Um, and you'll be able to kind of build out your own custom self-monitoring setup in, in the home. So the camera, uh, I'm not gonna show it to you just because we haven't officially launched, but it will have voice control built in. It will have a two-way functionality. So kind of like the ring doorbells where you can talk um, to, to the person remotely through your phone. Uh, it'll even have some form of, uh, of geofencing and facial recognition built into it. So, so we're still kind of getting all those final details, um, but it's exciting. It's, it's a really, really cool looking and, um, and, and just kind of an innovative product where something that uh, I don't think any other of our competitors have, have kind of been able to tackle yet. So no, no security keypad needed, you know, no, um, no, no hub. It's all kind of built into the thermostat and the camera. So that's, that's what's coming next. Awesome. I was also expecting you to say no to that question. So thank you. Yeah. Just, just don't, don't put it on uh, on YouTube quite yet, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get you in trouble. All right. Yeah, wait, Dad, wait a week or so. Get back to the original topic and I'm going to mute myself yeah. for a while. Okay. Sounds good. Sure. Um, so one thing we, uh, we really like to touch on is, you know, what the homeowner's looking for, kind of what's, what's on their mind as far as a, a Wi-Fi smart home product. Um, one of the big selling points with Ecobee is the, the usability. So just the, the ease of use. Um, you can see that the phone, you know, the mobile app is gonna be an exact mirror image of the thermostat face itself. So whether you're on an Android, an Apple iPhone, uh, a tablet, um, the look and feel is always really consistent. A lot of homeowners find it just very intuitive and they pick it up easily. Contractors find it very easy to install as well um, because whether, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter which device you're on, that screen is always gonna look very similar. So whether you're on your watch, your iPad, your phone, um, you know, definitely a big selling point. Uh, we have the highest rated app on the market with smart stats. Um, we've really taken that approach you know, if you look um, at the thermostat itself here, it's really a smartphone on the wall. And, you know, smartphones have been around now for about a decade. So I think Apple rolled out the very first iPhone in like 08 or 09. And almost everybody today has a smartphone or tablet or, or something similar. You know, most, most homeowners out there are just familiar with with the, the format of a smart device and, you know, the touchscreen functionality, the little icons on the bottom, you know, you've got your quick changes, your weather information, your menu. Um, so really set up similar to most of your, your modern day smart devices. Um, there are certain factors that the homeowner is really looking for when we're designing these products. Uh, we try to hit on all of those. And, and we, you know, we adapt as, as technology advances and as the market changes, um, some of the priorities are gonna change. But today it's really, you know, it's gotta have that stunning look. It's gotta have that uh, visual appeal. You know, you see it on the wall, doesn't look like a thermostat. Uh, a lot of people think about Nest when they think about smart stats. Um, I've gotta say Nest when it came out, um, it was pretty innovative as far as the, the appearance, you know, like people had never seen a thermostat that looked like that before. And, and we've taken a different approach in that we're really trying to mimic a smartphone. Um, so it's a touch screen, um, you know, fully functional uh, smart device really on your wall. Uh, it's got the voice control built in. So you've got Alexa on your wall. Um, you've got a, a lot of different cool things that, that the Alexa speaker will do. Um, and then probably the biggest other biggest feature uh, besides ease of use for the homeowner is going to be that control on the go. 
So um, when you think of control on the go, that's just talking about regardless of what kind of device it is, um, it could be any Wi-Fi enabled smart home item they've got in their in their house. Their you know their cameras, their uh, their their Wi-Fi refrigerators and ranges, and everything's got Wi-Fi in it now. And it's just the fact that people can kind of monitor and see what's going on at home when they're not there. Uh, that's a really big selling point. And with HVAC, <clears throat> obviously, if your heat or your AC stops working, you're going to quickly have a problem. So we've uh, we've built in all those customized alerts: high temperature, low humidity. Uh, if your system, you know, stops stops functioning, you, the homeowners get to get that alert. And regardless of where they're at in the country, they might be down in Florida for the winter. Uh, they'll be able to see kind of what's going on in the house when they're not there. So, so that's a big deal. Um, the sensors, we'll explain those, but um, primarily they're going to offer two advantages over most of our competitors is they're going to provide extra comfort by, um, by balancing out that, that temperature throughout the home, just those natural hot, uh, hot and cold spots. Uh, there's different ways you can manage those, but the sensors also will provide savings. So through a setback when no one's in the house, it's going to go into that soft setback mode on its own. It's going to let the room temperature kind of creep from the set point. Um, so with all that said, you know, with, with the pros out there, with, with our customers and the pro channel, which is the, um, the division I'm in, we really focus on reliability. I would say um, probably more than anything with contractors, the reliability of Ecobee has, um, has been a huge success for us. Um, we don't mess around with a battery. So you've got to have a common wire hooked up to these. Um, you don't exactly have to have one, but it needs to be hardwired. You need a constant power source. Um, if you don't have a common wire run to the thermostat, we're always going to give you an add a wire. So we call it the power extender kit or PEK for short. It's basically a four to five wire uh, adapter that's going to be in the box with either residential model. It's just always there. Um, if you do have that common wire, there's no battery inside the thermostat. We don't mess around with the battery because uh, we, we want the, the functionality to be reliable. And when, what happens when a battery is, is in there, it's you know, a lithium ion battery. It, it needs to maintain a charge to keep the thermostat functional. And over time, you know, battery, batteries have a finite lifespan. Um, I think every industry has this challenge when it comes to, um, to lithium ion and, and wireless technology. Uh, the battery life is gonna fade. So after a couple of years, a lot of times what happens is uh, that battery doesn't last as long as it used to. You're stealing power off the furnace board to keep it charged. And at certain times, especially extreme cold conditions, you know, the furnace is constantly kicking on or kicking off. Uh, that battery won't maintain a charge and it just shuts down. And that's when homeowners panic. And that's what contractors really um, don't like. So, so we really are looking to eliminate those service calls and get away from those, those headaches with the homeowners where the thermostat randomly shuts off and uh, it's the middle of winter and, and your furnace stops running, you know. So you won't have those problems with our, with our products. Hey, Pete. Any questions? Uh, yeah. We have a bunch of questions, but one of them kind of ties into that uh, battery wiring type discussion. Uh, John asks uh, if, if there's any plans to have like a furnace mounted sub base uh, so you can possibly start installing these stats with only four wires. So basically have the stat wired to some kind of sub base and then the sub base has six, seven, eight wires going to the furnace. Yeah, uh, we get that question all the time. Um, we actually, you know, when we started out as a company 10 years ago, that that's what we did. Um, and we kind of got away from it because I, I would say, you know, probably 90% of the time it's it's not really a factor, but it's a great idea and it's a great recommendation and, and it's something we're really looking close at. Um, you know, we have this great partnership with Carrier and I can say we're working on like a two wire solution with boilers. But I can't say that we have like a, a remote interface module type setup in in the pipeline just yet. Um, I think you might see something coming from us down the road on that, but not not anytime soon. Uh, I will add that obviously the PEK kit helps you in getting that four wire to five wire leap. 
Uh, so you can get it done with four wires that way, John. And then if you need more than that, uh, we do use uh, add wire kits from Benstar, which sounds quirky, but we use those with Ecobee stats. So you can make your four wires into six wires if you needed to do that. There's also another one on the market from another competitor that makes another widget, but there's ways to get that done. If you're stuck, John, let us know and we'll help you work with the four wires you have to get it set up the best way you can. Um, Jim asks on the battery discussion, how does it maintain memory during a power outage if there's no battery? Yeah, so, um, you know, I say there's no battery. There's no battery to keep the thermostat functional. So when the power goes out, the, the thermostat's going to go off. There is a very low voltage battery to retain your, your settings. So um, you've got some time once the power goes out. Um, you've got a couple months before it completely gets wiped, but that low voltage battery will retain like your Wi-Fi settings, your preferences, your, your schedule, your comfort settings, all that stuff. So there is a small battery in there for, for settings. Yeah, the only thing that might happen on a power outage, if you don't have it hooked to Wi-Fi and it's powered off for a long time, you may have to go back and set the clock again. Not the schedule, but just like the actual clock. Um, but if you're on Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi will just push the clock time to you, so you'll be you'll be fixed in a matter of minutes anyway. So. And yeah, that's a good point. A lot of those settings are backed up because everything we do is cloud-based, so a lot of them just kind of get backed up to the cloud and get pushed back down anyways. So. Um, Roberto asks, can more than one smartphone be connected? Yeah, that's uh, that's something I was going to talk a lot about today. Um, we recently made some changes in the residential portal. Um, we used to just tell people log in with the same credentials on multiple devices, and you could have it on four different devices. You just use the same username and password. So you can do that, um, but what we've got now is a new feature um, where you can invite multiple users and those users would have a separate uh, account. So, so the answer is yes. Um, there's a couple of different ways you, you can manage. Awesome. All right, one more and then we'll, let, we'll switch back over. And you may not be able to answer this yet, but Mark, back when you're talking about the new camera idea, Mark was asking, um, do you need to have a thermostat to use the camera? And if so, will the camera be compatible with all vintages of Ecobee thermostats? Uh, yeah, so the answer to both is yes and yes. I, I don't understand exactly how that's going to work. Like they're, they're getting us, um, they're getting us samples out in the field here shipped and we'll all have the opportunity to, to experiment with these. But the, uh, the rundown we got this week showed that you could just have the camera and sensors or you could have just the thermostat and sensors, but you don't necessarily need both. Um, each one will independently double, sort of double as a, a, a hub. Um, so, so you wouldn't necessarily need a, the stat and the camera to use that monitoring service. That makes total sense. Uh, so the, the camera will just connect to your cloud account, just like your thermostat does. It's just one more widget on the cloud account. Um, yeah, I think so. Right. Awesome. Um, right. On the, on the multiple phone user thing you mentioned, Jim was asking for clarification if that is dependent upon the thermostat type you have or if it's dependent just because of the cloud. So can you have multiple users on any vintage of thermostat? Yeah, any, um, any Ecobee residential model, you would, um, you would be able to use you know, the same credentials on multiple devices or invite multiple users. It doesn't matter which model, it's all driven by the, the app and the software. Hopefully that answers the question. I believe so. All right, Okay. we're all caught up for now. Thank you, Pete. All right, cool. Thanks, Ryan. All right, I'll keep going here, guys. So, um, so obviously, you know, in Chicago, um, rebates are a big deal. So we always touch on this. We are Energy Star certified through the EPA. Now, the way we qualify for this is we've demonstrated that on average, we can provide up to 23% savings for your typical homeowner. Um, this is really, you know, more residential, single family homes. Uh, the way we do that is kind of what I mentioned earlier with the sensors. Uh, when no one is in the house, typically after a couple hours, and we have some new stuff I'm gonna talk about where you can customize it, but after um, two hours, traditionally, 
of no occupancy, the system's gonna go into that setback mode all by itself. Homeowner doesn't have to adjust anything. Um, and it's gonna work to save them money. So 23%, uh, in my experience, is pretty accurate in the Midwest, just because our weather's so crazy here. Um, you know, like I, I envy the guys down in South Florida that work for us or Southern California, because uh, the weather's so much more stable throughout the year. Um, they're probably not going to save as much money in those areas of the country, but in the Midwest, 23% um, is pretty spot on, I think. Um, just because, like you guys have seen it just this week, it was it was like 75 the other day, and I'm outside in shorts and a t-shirt, and now it's 40. Uh, so with those big temperature and humidity swings from you know day to day, week to week, uh, you're going to see pretty good savings by installing an Ecobee. Uh, I would say if you get questions it's probably about 20 to 25 bucks a month on your typical, you know, two, three bedroom, single family home. Um, that's going to equate to a pretty good chunk of change annually. So, so, you know, what we talk about is if you go and you apply through ComEd for the, for the rebate, you're going to get 75 bucks. On top of that, you're going to save 20, 25 bucks a month. Um, the cost of the thermostat is really going to pay for itself in the first year. So pretty good deal. Um, the other thing you know, to keep in mind is we're comparing it to a 72 degree hold. So we don't have an exact science as far as calculating savings. The best we can do is use that 72 degree hold as a benchmark. And we're kind of assuming homeowners don't adjust the set point throughout the day or they're not using a schedule. Uh, what we do know is 80% of programmable thermostats, like typically your Honeywell Vision Pros and different stats that are out there, touch screen, programmable uh, on, on a wall, just never get set up. You know, most people never program them. Uh, and with ours, you don't have to program it. It's just all built into the, the sensors and, and the, uh, the artificial intelligence and the software that, that we've got built into these. So, um, so 72 degree hold, we understand it's not always gonna be exactly, um, you know what what that savings number is but it's pretty pretty good swag pretty accurate um and then the other thing is with rebates you know people can get these through comed on their marketplace um i live in chicago so i know this all too well you're gonna see um at times you know the utility companies will have these out on their website um they'll offer them at a pretty competitive price so a lot of times what they're doing is they're just taking that utility rebate and they're building it into the price as an instant rebate. So they'll they'll list it online for hey get your you know Ecobee Smart Thermostat Pro for 175 bucks, but um, what the homeowner doesn't always realize is that they're not going to get that rebate back twice. They're already getting um, they're taking advantage of that 75 dollar rebate in the price. If they get it through their contractor, they can apply for the 75 dollar rebate. If they go and buy it on their own on Amazon or something they're still gonna get that rebate. Uh, just a slightly different process as far as how you get, get the rebate back, but you're always gonna qualify for it. So just be careful when you get those questions from homeowners, they think they're getting a smoking deal if they buy it through ComEd. It's really, uh, it's not apples to apples. <laughs> Any questions? We did have a couple. Um, related to what we're talking about right now, uh, David asks, uh, what does Ecobee typically save versus a normal programmable thermostat? I'm assuming he's talking about a programmable thermostat that's actually being programmed, which is, as you know, is key. Right. Um, I would say it's still probably going to be somewhere close to 20%, even if they're using that programmable feature, um, just because, you know, depending on how they have it set up and how they program our sensors and everything. Um, but, but, but the biggest, perk to using the, the room sensors is, and even the occupancy built into the thermostat, whether or not the homeowner's thinking about it, it's going into that setback feature. Um, it could be, you know, while they're already in their away mode on a schedule, so maybe they, they take it down to 65 in a way, this is going to stretch it even more. It's going to let that uh, room temperature drop maybe to 62, 63 above and beyond where they've they've got the setback on the schedule. So it's still gonna save them uh, quite significantly over just a programmable stat. 
Right. And, but you got to enable all the stuff. You got to enable smart home away. You got to let it track you with the motion sensors. If you do all those things, because uh, if you have a programmable stat, you're going to set it to go from a certain time to a certain time. And then when you're not home, it's still doing that because it doesn't know you're not home. So that's where a lot of that savings comes in. Although this month, yeah, there's probably know. almost no savings because everybody's home. But a normal month. <laughs> yeah, I've actually, I've had that question come up a lot. Like, uh, there's no control on the go advantage because everyone's stuck in their house. And and uh, yeah, there's really no setback. But uh, but you're right. You're absolutely right, Ryan. Like, if they just turn those setback features off, then they're really not going to save any more than they would your traditional right. program. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I, I get the weekly emails from my smart meter from my electric utility. And like the first week that my kids and everybody were home all the time, it's like, oh, you're using 43% more energy. Try these different things to save energy. I'm like, that's not why, dude. Like, it's because everybody's here and everybody's <laughs> bulbs on and everybody's Xboxing and whatever else. Uh, <laughs> exactly. It's such a such a weird time right now. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, one more here. I'm not I'm not sure where this one's coming from, but I'm gonna ask it. Kyle asks. Uh, is there a way to recalibrate the Ecobee without resetting the device or changing the temp offsets? I'm not sure what he means by recalibrate. Um, yeah, there's a couple couple things. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what he means either, but if he's talking about kind of wiping out the preferences or the schedule, you can reset the thermostat and just clear the preferences. Um, if he's talking more about the smart features built into it, you know, you're not going to recalibrate it unless you do a hard reset and it kind of does a factory wipe. Yeah, he, he might also be talking about like the one I have here in my office. Um, I don't always notice it, but every few months I'll notice it'll actually say recalibrating on the screen. And it'll kind of be like offline for like five minutes while it does whatever it's doing. I don't know what it's recalibrating, but it will say that every once in a while, every few months. It may be part of that. I don't know. Uh, yeah. So that you're going to notice that typically when you first install it, it uh, it might take up to like 15 minutes to calibrate. Um, I suppose once in a while when there's a firmware, if it's a major software update, you might see that happen as well. Usually if it's the minor software change, we just push it over Wi-Fi and you don't notice. Uh, but once in a while, it, it will sort of go into that calibration mode to update over Wi-Fi. So that could be yeah. what he means. Yeah, and, and if, if he wants to get the thermostat up to the latest software uh, version or, you, you know, he wants a specific thing fixed, all we need is the serial number and we need the thermostat on Wi-Fi and we can push those fixes uh, based on the serial number. We can push it out remotely. Yeah, it, I don't know if you're planning on the future, but it is kind of quirky on this stat compared to all other stats I play with. There's no buttons on the stat where I can request a download of the new software. I have to like phone call to ask for that, which is kind of quirky. So going forward, it'd be nice if I could ask for it on demand, like from the stat, like other like my cell phone and other widgets, you know? Yeah, no, I've never heard that before. I'll uh, I'll add that to your list, right? Oh, really? On the Ecobee chat groups, that's like one of the biggest things. Like people are always like debating with each other which software version they have versus somebody else because then they know there's a new one. Obviously, you can't push it to every stat immediately because there's just thousands and thousands and thousands of stats. So you have to kind of stay. Yeah. But to, to Pete's point for everybody listening, if you have a stat where you need to do the update because you need a certain feature or there's some kind of quirky problem, if you just call and ask, they'll push you the update. Otherwise, you if you wait, eventually you'll get your update. But yeah, we we actually have close to two million, I think, online now. Um, so the way it works is really, you know, it's looking for the oldest software out there. So, you know, if you go buy one that's been a, a, at a warehouse for six months, it's going to have an older version. That's going to be the priority. It's going to update those older versions out there. And um, yeah, we can't just kind of push everything out at once because it's not scalable, I guess. Yeah. That makes sense. All right, we are caught up on questions, sir. All right, sounds good. Awesome. Um, so let's dive into the functionality of the STAD and sensors. Um, a lot of you guys have probably kind of heard this spiel before. You know, we, we spent a lot of time explaining the sensors, uh, but I also think it's probably the most valuable thing to, to kind of explain in detail. Um, just because homeowners don't always figure out 
kind of what options they have when, when they're buying an Ecobee. Uh, so this is where the contractor can really help them sort of dial in their system, their schedule, kind of um, kind of help them achieve, you know, whatever issues they're they're trying to uh, to, to to resolve in their in their house as far as temperature differences and things. So um, so if you think about where your thermostat is traditionally, uh, it's probably on your dining room wall or your hallway. And what we've always train guys to do is you know you want to keep it mounted on an inside wall um, you're trying to keep it sort of central in the home it's usually on the first floor and you're really just measuring like that core temperature in the house um, the problem has always been that you know you've got these hot and cold spots upstairs uh, you might have you know a den in the back of the house that gets direct sunlight shining in heats up in the afternoon uh, just natural temperature differences throughout the home and the thermostat on your uh, dining room wall doesn't know that, right? And that's, um, that's really the, the big advantage of our sensors. So our room sensors were born out of the fact that, um, you know, you can put these around the house where you've got those natural temperature differences and you can use them more than anything to really change how the temperature throughout the home is represented instead of just measuring the temperature on your dining room or hallway wall, right? Um, so, when we rolled these out initially, the complaint from homeowners was, hey, I've got this bedroom. It's always four or five degrees off from the rest of the house. Maybe I need new windows in there. Maybe I need insulation. But nonetheless, I can't afford zoning. I can't afford to fix some of these problems. Um, I'm just looking for a simple solution to kind of even out the, the comfort level you know, uh, uh, around the house. So this is really where the sensors come in. And, we don't market it as zoning. It's not doing what zoning's doing. It's not changing the direction of the airflow. Um, it's really just changing how you use temperature input at the thermostat. <clears throat> so obviously the more sensors, the better, but you don't need a ton of these. Um, you can add up to 32 of them. Either way, you know, the, the original Gen 1 room sensor or the new smart sensor, which is pictured on the screen here, um, they're completely interchangeable. So you can use the uh, the new sensor going back to the Ecobee 3, any of the, um, the touch screen um, residential models we've made, you can use the, the new sensor on and you can use the old sensor forward uh, up to the, the, the latest. The Smart Thermostat Pro will, um, will work with the original sensors as well. Uh, so up to 32, most people have uh, the thermostat and a couple sensors, maybe two or three sensors for your typical house is about uh, what you're going to see. And that, that's going to get the job done, no problem. So a couple differences with the new sensor. Um, we made some improvements. We rolled these out last year. And probably the biggest issue we had on the original was the battery life. So um, the original battery life was like a year, year and a half, I would say, is kind of what we'd see. And it's gonna ping you at the thermostat or on your phone to change the battery and the battery gets low. These new ones, um, they're using a CR2477 battery. So it, it comes with, um, with the battery in there and they'll have up to about five year life. So about three times with the, uh, with the original sensors. For it. So pretty long, um, you've got, pretty good um, increase in range as well over the original sensors. So somewhere around hundred feet, I think on the original, we said 60 feet. I would say um, I've, I've played around with these and I've been able to stretch it over hundred feet, no problem. And they still communicate with the thermostat. Um, that's gonna vary based on the application. So if you're putting these in a commercial application and you've got concrete, cinder block walls, steel walls, it's definitely gonna knock that range down. Um, this is a 915 megahertz radio frequency between the thermostat and the sensor. And um, the way this works is the sensor, so today you do have to pair these through the account while the sensor is connected or while the thermostat is connected to the network. So, um, so it has to be on Wi-Fi to actually connect it. But whether the Wi-Fi is connected or not at the thermostat, the sensors will still work. So you can still use the sensors even if your Wi-Fi is out, even if you don't have Wi-Fi, they're still going to communicate with the thermostat over radio frequency. Um, you don't want to connect the sensors to the network because the more devices you add in your house, the slower your, your network speed gets. 
Um, and we want those those sensors to provide the comfort and the savings, you know, whether or not someone's online. So, um, another big improvement is the infrared technology. So, really, uh, newer infrared, much faster refresh rate. So, it's looking for an infrared body heat read, specifically 98.6, 99 degrees human body temperature and it's looking for motion. So if it doesn't have that body heat read and the motion together simultaneously, um, it's not gonna tell the system that, that there's occupancy, occupancy in the room. So <clears throat> what that means is, you know, if you have like a, if you have younger kids like I do, you go to a birthday party, they come home with like one of those Mylar balloons and the balloons floating around the house. You know, I have a security system and that balloon will trigger the alarm even though you know there's no one in the house because the balloon just floating. So it picks up the motion, detects occupancy that way. With ours, it's not gonna detect, detect occupancy because it doesn't have that, that body heat read. Um, so you've gotta have them both together. And um, you've got a few different ways you can manage your system, right? So they're, they're designed not to pick up pets because pets are usually uh, higher body temperature, like 100 degrees plus. And you're, you're really gonna put them where there's foot traffic, like I said earlier, uh, you know, bedrooms, living room, TV room, den, probably don't need it in the kitchen because the kitchen's going to get hot when you're cooking. You don't want to put it on a windowsill where cold air is going to penetrate in through the glass. Uh, just be thoughtful about where you're placing them. And you just need like, you know, if you got a thermostat on the first floor, maybe one extra sensor on the first floor, maybe one or two sensors upstairs. Um, so not a, not a lot of sensors you need. So as far as programming them, or I, should, I should take a quick break there, Ryan. Any questions? Yeah, we do have a couple yeah. sensor questions. Uh, Andrew asks if you think it'll help with a tri-level home. Uh, to an extent, you know, what I always tell guys is if you've got an extreme temperature difference, you know, like if they've got a tri-level and it's all on one zone, you might go down to the basement and it's 10 degrees warmer upstairs than it is in the basement. It's only going to help within a few degrees to kind of balance that out, and that's what I'll talk about here. But um, if it's if it's within like four five degrees, it's really going to help balance the comfort out. If it's beyond five, like closer to ten degrees difference, I wouldn't say this is going to do the trick. You know, you've got bigger issues. Uh, you're always going to be better off zoning it or you know figuring out why there's such a big difference. I'd, I'd add that. There, there isn't really any way for your air handling system to provide different temperatures to different rooms. So no, no matter if you put in one sensor or 10,000 sensors, the temperature is not gonna be any different in the rooms. The benefit, in my opinion at least, comes in when you allow it to do the follow me function and it knows you're downstairs hanging out in the basement watching TV and you're not upstairs. So it just says, screw it, I don't care about upstairs. Let's make you comfortable downstairs and then vice versa when you go back up. Um, right. You want to be more comfortable because you have two stories, tri-level, whatever, putting the Ecobee stats in with like a three zone panel with dampers, that would be a better way to do it because then you could actually provide more or less airflow to the different areas. But unless you damper it or unless you put in separate pieces of equipment, every room is going to get the full airflow whenever the air handling system turns on, no matter what you do with the sensors. Absolutely. Um, we had a few more sensor ones. Uh, Ferris asks, are those sensors can be switched with each other locations and does the thermostat recognize them as just a number of them? I don't know what he's saying. Our sensor or my sensor ID. Um, I think he's asking if the, the sensors around the, the house physically, I think is what he's asking. Um, and yeah, you could do that. Yeah, so, you know, if I add some sensors here to this thermostat. Um, I could add a few of them and you can move them around. Um, when you pair the sensor, it's gonna ask you to change the name if you want. So each sensor has a unique four digit like alphanumeric number on it. Um, most people are gonna call it like living room, master bedroom, they're gonna change that, that identity. And when you go into your thermostat, uh, you're gonna see them listed out here, right? So this is a, simulator tool it's showing offline but you you have the ability to rename these um and you probably 
you know, if you have multiple sensors, you're not going to need to move them around much. If you just have one sensor and you want to take it upstairs with you uh, before you go to bed or something, then that's totally fine. You can do that. Yeah, a lot of people do that at first. They get the one sensor in the box. So that's what they do and they move it around. And then after a couple of months, they're like, uh, I'm just going to get another sensor. <laughs> just leave it there. Uh, they just get lazy and want to do it that way, obviously. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, um, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Ryan. Sorry. Um, the, I, there's Kyle's asking about the statement of backwards compatible and asking if that means you can use the new sensors with an older model of thermostat. Yes, absolutely. As long as it's a residential touchscreen, so it would be the Ecopee 3, 3 Lite, 4, and now the new 5, the Smart Pro. You can use them with any of them interchangeably. All right, Justin asks if the infrared sensors on the on the uh, on the sensors can be used uh, with a self monitoring security system. Yeah, that's exactly what we're doing. So that's what I was talking about earlier, and that's what you guys are going to see um, when our marketing campaign rolls out next week. Um, those room sensors will double as indoor occupancy. Uh, the therm some of the thermostats have that occupancy sensor built into the face of it. Um, same thing with, you know, some of the other gadgets, like, you know, we already have a light switch or switch plus. Um, you'll be able to put occupancy into other devices, and then you'll also have um, the, the existing room sensors. It, it's all driven through the software. They're just going to double as an occupancy read indoors. All right, David asks, uh, how touchy is the follow me feature? If someone moves from room to room for a short period of time, what happens? Yeah, well, are there um, are there more questions, Ryan? Uh, there are a couple, if you want to come back, circle back to that one, yeah. Uh, yeah, let asks, me explain that one. Yeah, Edward asks if you can run a remote sensor only and ignore the thermostat sensor. Same thing, so I'll explain that. Um, right. the, the answer's not short. <laughs> <laughs> right, no worries. And then Andrew asks, can you change the home away temperature change? I don't know what he means by temperature change. He's asking if, oh, uh, if you can define yeah. what the setback is for right. the, the, the soft automatic setback. And the answer is you can't, you can't say exactly in degrees, but I'll get into that after this as well, where I'll show you a new feature that we've rolled out where you can, you can adjust it. You just can't tell it exactly in degrees what you want that setback to be unless you use a schedule. So. And then Andrew asks, uh, if we upgrade our phone, can we download the app without losing the zoning options? I'm not sure what the zoning options are in that statement. Um, download the app. Yeah, so if you do a phone and download the app, it's going to have all the same information in your, your old phone with your old app hat because you're logging into the same account. But I'm not sure what the zoning options he's asking about are. So. You probably just asking if you still see the sensors on there, and I yep. would say, yeah, you know, no matter what device you're using, or if you're at the thermostat, you always see the sensors listed out for each zone that you're managing. All right, I think we are caught up. All right, cool. So the guys that we kind of skipped over there, um, I'll answer that those questions in detail here. Um, so there's three ways to manage comfort using our room sensors. Um, you've got averaging which is gonna be like your basic. So if you think about it in a good, better, best type scenario, your good is gonna be averaging. Averaging just means that when you install the thermostat and a couple sensors, it will take a constant temperature read. It's just sort of like this diagram you see of the home here. This is my house to a T. I'm in Oak Park. It's a classic Chicago four square old house. Um, if you're averaging, you're just using constant temperature input from the thermostat and the sensors 24 seven. And it's just gonna calculate that average and it's gonna push hot or cold air until the average amongst those sensors uh, satisfies to the step point, right? So if it's always 74 up here, when the thermostat's 72, it's gonna overcool down here, maybe a degree or two. It's gonna try to keep it a little closer to 72 upstairs, right? That's all it's doing with averaging. Uh, the joke we always use, Ryan's heard this a million times. Everybody's equally as uncomfortable, right? So not changing the airflow, not actually uh, monitoring, you know, 
difference in temperature through zoning type setup. It's just gonna uh, balance out that comfort level and just gonna try to bring the comfort level a little bit closer for everybody in the home um, automatically without adjusting the stuff. Right? Um, follow me. So <clears throat> what Ryan alluded to earlier, uh, probably our most popular feature with the sensors, homeowners love follow me. Uh, if you just enable it, so you have the option to go in to the thermostat or your phone, turn this on, turn it off. If follow me is engaged, um, it's going to use occupancy to drive how the sensors prior, prioritize your, your runtime. So in follow me, like in this picture, you've got people sitting in the living room where the thermostat is. It's picking up that body temperature and motion. You got a kid up in the bedroom playing. You've got a third sensor over in the master bedroom. Follow me is just going to say, okay, where the people are, we're going to use the thermostat and the sensor for temperature input. We're going to take the average of these two. We're going to ignore the sensor in the master bedroom because no one's in there. Um, after five minutes, the HVAC will kick on. So once that sensor picks up occupancy and there's a temperature differential big enough to, to, to create a call for heater cool, that sensor is going to ping the stat. It's going to say after five minutes, we don't want to short cycle the equipment, so wait five minutes, then kick the air on, start cooling up here to 72, right? If no one's down here in front of the thermostat, it's going to ignore the temperature read here. If the kid moves from this bedroom over to the master bedroom, it's going to wait five minutes again to start to pick up occupancy here. It's going to wait 30 minutes to disassociate or forget the occupancy read where he was in the other room. So five minutes to transfer, 30 minutes to, to forget. Um, in the meantime, it'll just take the average between the two and then it'll completely shift over to just this sensor. So it's all automatic and it's all driven off of an, an occupancy read. Finally, and I'll, I'll explain the third one and then we can take questions because I know there will be some. Um, so averaging basic, follow me better. Best solution, what contractors love about it the most. Um, you can use our participation mode to manually tell the system which sensors to use and not use. And I'll just switch over to the simulator again. So for example, you go in, you set up your schedule. So you've got to use a schedule to drive this, uh, but you're really just prioritizing uh, throughout different times of the day which sensors you want to use for temperature input. So you have your schedule in place. You can do this a couple ways. You can go into the sensors and you can say, okay, uh, this is my sensor upstairs. This is the thermostat downstairs. I'm going to go in here and I'm just going to use the thermostat for temperature input in my home comfort setting. I'm going to turn off the away and the sleep mode. And in this one, I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to turn it off when I'm home. I'm only going to use it when I'm away or when I'm sleeping. Um, maybe it's always warmer upstairs and you want to save a few extra bucks and not run the air as much as you would have otherwise when you're gone. Um, maybe you just want it to be nice and cool in the master bedroom when you're sleeping, right? So with this participation mode, you can say, okay, um, let me just switch back to the slide here. I only want to use the sensor on my nightstand. Keep it in nice, cool 69 degrees in here when I'm sleeping. You know, people like it cool when they're sleeping. Ignore the temperature down here. Ignore the temperature in the spare room. Maybe no one's in there. Um, from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. based on my schedule, this is when I want to use the sensor. The difference between follow me and participation is in a follow me mode, it's always going to automatically switch based on that occupancy. So if you're in follow me and you've got teenagers coming home at 2 a.m. and you're up here sleeping, it's going to pick them up on the first floor and it's going to start to use that sensor or the thermostat for temperature input. If you're not in follow me and you're using the participation mode, it's just going to use this sensor no matter what between that eight hour period during your sleep time. And it's going to ignore any, any occupancy. So if someone walks down here middle of the night, someone goes downstairs to get a midnight snack, it's going to ignore that, that occupancy and it's not going to use the sensor temperature. So a lot of information there. I'm sure there's a few questions. Go for it, Ryan, if you got some. All right, we do have one question from Andrew asking if we can use Ecobee thermostats with a Honeywell EIM zone system. Uh, no, unfortunately, it just wouldn't. Um, it's it's not set up that way. It, it wouldn't work. 
Let, let me clarify too. You, you can use the Ecobee stats on the Honeywell zone board. You just can't use the EIM wireless communication part. So I have a lot of Ecobee stats on Honeywell yes. zone boards, but they have to hardwire back to the zone board. Um, Correct. It'll work with zoning boards. It just won't work off their EIM. Yeah. Correct. Um, and you can pretty much do that. And I'm not going to say all, but most zoning boards. So personally, I have them on. Uh, I have them on old uh, zone patrols. I have them on Honeywell zone boards, old and current ones. I have them on the Carrier and Bryant three zone zone panels. We put them on Zonex, California Economizer, Jackson System panels. It can pretty much work on any of those panels because those panels are just looking for R G Y W type signals. Um, right. It won't work if you have something that's proprietary. So like Carrier Comfort Zone can't do it. Bryant Zone Perfect Plus can't do it. The Honeywell wireless stuff can't do it because those are all proprietary. But most of your zone panels, you could probably get it done. If, you, if you're not sure, let Pete or I know and we'll look at it uh, and tell you before you promise the customer something. Yeah, even um, if you need to use like the PEK at a wire, sometimes you need to put it at the, the, the zone board. I don't know if you said that, Ryan. But... I, I didn't say it, but that <laughs> is true. I hadn't, the room I'm sitting in right now is actually wired that way. Yeah, so we could walk you guys through that if you run into an issue like that, no problem. Um, Johnny asks, uh, if you are still for, if you're still in the room for a little while, does it still, what? if you are still for a little while in a room, does it still know it's occupied? Oh, um, it, yeah, yeah, so it still probably means if you're motionless, does it think you're occupied, like sleeping or something? Exactly. Yeah, I think that's probably what he's asking. Um, it's always going to take 30 minutes to disassociate. So the answer is like if you're using follow me and there is. So let's say you're in there sleeping during the night and you're, you're just using the follow me mode. The sensor will pick up occupancy as long as there's some movement every half an hour. But if you lay there and you sleep like a mummy and you don't move, there's no guarantee that it's going to know uh, someone's in the room, right? So as, as long as every 30 minutes uh, there's some some activity, then it will continue to to read an occupancy. Um, but if um, you know if you're using a big heavy down comforter and you don't toss and turn during the night like most people, not 100% uh, that it that it's going to pick you up, right? All right, we are caught up on questions, Pete. All right, great. So, um, guys, just a quick recap. Uh, basic averaging, right? Better is going to be your follow me, turn on, turn it off. Homeowner loves it, set it and forget it sort of mode. Uh, your best is going to be driven by a schedule, and it's that participation mode. Uh, what I see in Chicago a lot is with uh with two flat brownstone three flat type buildings you've usually got a boiler down in the basement if it's an old setup um, you can wire the thermostat by the equipment right you can put it in an inconvenient location you can control everything from your phone and you can turn the thermostat read off and you can put a couple sensors up on each floor and use those sensors 24 7 in that participation mode so that's that's one thing that's really nice about it is you know you're you're always going to default back to the thermostat if the sensor battery goes out but you can use those sensors just constantly to monitor temperature and to to drive the um the heater the cool call in, in a building like that not everybody's going to do that in their house because people like how they look on the wall but it's come up more and more especially in uh like lower income areas where they want to restrict the users from jacking the the ac set point up or down things like that um, big 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 trend is is what we're seeing here so i want to mention that <clears throat> um so another new feature is something that we're calling eco plus so eco plus is all built into the software and it's really more than anything it's artificial intelligence so um i always like to talk about nest a little bit uh, nest is a learning thermostat you know people um people believe that you know, if they have a nest, they, they never, never have to worry about adjusting the set point. It's going to kind of learn your behavior. It's going to learn your preferences, your, your comfort level, and it's going to calibrate. Um, we've never taken that approach like nest. So we are using the sensors to know if you're in the house or not. 
with a pretty high level of confidence. Uh, those sensors will know if someone's there or not. And that's what's gonna determine the change in the set point. Um, with Eco Plus, we're introducing some more options. So when you go into that setback mode, um, it used to always be two hours, you know, no occupancy read. It's gonna go into that setback. It's gonna let the room temperature rise or fall a few degrees typically. A lot of it's going to depend on the efficiency of your system, you know, based on the runtime history, how quick can the system heat or cool the home, um, what kind of equipment are you running, right? Are you running a heat pump? Are you running a furnace, a boiler? Uh, different levels of setback, you know, depending on the equipment. And it's always designed to recover within 30 minutes. So based on the outdoor weather, the efficiency, the equipment, um, 30 minutes was always the target to recover once someone came back in the house. So two hours. You know, once you leave, the clock starts, goes into a setback. Um, that's just, you know, designed so whether or not you're thinking about it, if you need to leave town on a whim, like you got an emergency, um, the, the system's gonna go into a setback and it's gonna work to save the homeowner money, whether or not they adjust the set point or use the schedule. Um, what Eco Plus now does is it allows them to customize how aggressive they want that setback to sort of kick in. So smart home, smart away is the soft setback feature. That means, you know, when you're home and you shouldn't be home, it's going to keep you comfortable when you're gone. Uh, but maybe the schedule says you should be home. It's going to save you money. You can still turn this on or off at the thermostat. Um, you still have the ability to disable it right at the stat when you, when you install these. Now, within Eco Plus, the user on their phone, they're not going to see the screen in the thermostat. They're going to see it on, on their mobile, um, mobile device. We're going to recommend when you install it, probably tell them to keep it towards the lower end. Keep it towards a minimum. It's still going to be relatively mild as far as that setback. It's going to wait a couple hours before it kicks in. It's usually going to be just a few degrees as far as the, um, the room temperature. You know, that's what the question earlier was. Can you tell um, the system exactly in degrees how far to set back? You can't tell it in degrees, but you can adjust this up or down. So with Eco Plus, if you're using it at a minimum, it's going to wait longer to set to set in. Uh, if you crank it up to a max, that setback, it's going to kick in a lot quicker. More like a half an hour once you leave the house, it's going to go into that setback mode. And it's going to stretch in degrees how far the room temperature deviates from the set point. So if you're using this at a max, you're going to want to save more money i would think like this is going to be for people that prioritize savings over comfort it's not gonna be as um as quick to recover back to your scheduled set point sometimes if you crank this all the way up it might take a while uh once the ac kicks back on to get back back to temperature in the house if you're using it at a mim it's always going to be about 30 minutes um really just allows a user to sort of prioritize or, or adjust how, how they want that setback to, to work. Any questions on that? Um, we do have several questions here. Uh, David asks, how do you know if it's reading you if you aren't moving much? Is there a way to tell? Yeah, so you can look on your phone at any time and you'll see a sensor, um, you'll, each sensor is listed out and you'll see occupied, unoccupied at each individual sensor. So you can always tell by looking at, at your, your app. So, and it'll also tell you on the actual stat as well, same kind of thing. Yeah, I think so. Um, I don't know if these these were shown unavailable, but yeah, it would it would show you at the thermostat under the menu. Right. You're gonna see the room temperature in occupied, unoccupied here, and then you would see the same exact thing on your phone. Yeah. Right. Um, John asks, what is the range of the sensor, meaning uh, how much of the room does it see? In a large basement, would you need more than one sensor? It's a big room. Um, you know, the sensors are designed to look about 50 feet across a room. So if it's bigger than 50 feet wide, then I would say, yeah, maybe put one on each side. Like a lot of, uh, a lot of schools use these and they'll put a few in a gymnasium because it's a pretty big room. But for your typical residential setup, one sensor per room should be plenty. 
All right, Andrew asks, um, in an apartment building, can we install the Ecobee stat in the boiler room, put the sensors in the apartments, and then just tell the Ecobee stat to ignore its own internal sensor? Yeah, exactly. So jumping back to the simulator here, in that scenario, if you've got a sensor in each apartment for temperature, um, you know, first thing is you probably kind of want to put it fixed on the wall out of reach. You probably don't want to just leave it on a bookshelf like most people will do. Um, but you would go in to your sensors here in the thermos that will show up just like another room sensor. And you can say, so the, the reason it's not allowing me to pick home is because as long as you've got one of those sensors covering each uh, comfort setting, go into uh, to your sensor and the thermostat and you can turn them all off. And this is saying now 24 seven, we're never gonna use the thermostat as temperature input. We're only gonna use these other sensors in the apartments. So you absolutely can do that. I will add that if you're using the Ecobee for humidification or dehumidification, then, then don't stick that in the boiler room, stick it somewhere better than that, right? So if you're telling it to run the cooling to dehumidify and then you stick this thing in essentially an unconditioned space, that's not gonna give you a great result. Same thing with at a house. If you wanna put the Ecobee downstairs in the basement by the furnace to kind of hide it and put these little petite sensors all over the house, that's cool, you can do that. But just remember the humidity sensing is always at the stat, not at the remote sensors. Yeah, great point, yep. Um, Scott says he's looking on his Ecobee app actually right now and he doesn't see Eco Plus option. Can you access it through mobile? Yeah, so the deal with, uh, with Eco Plus, I'm, I'm guessing Scott probably has like an older model, maybe the three or the four. Um, we only have rolled it out initially on the Smart Thermostat Pro, so the latest model. Uh, it's all in the mobile app. So if he wanted to send us his serial number, we can push it, uh, the update out to any uh, any model out there, but initially, just because we have so many in the field, we're only loading that Eco Plus feature on the, the Smart Pro. Um, it will eventually get updated to every residential model. It's just going to take a little while. Yeah, on a related note, on my Eco B4, I think that one, I just got an email this week asking me if I wanted to use Eco, B plus, Eco plus. Oh, there you go. That's probably because uh, you're such an important customer of ours, Ryan. You know, we, we yeah, need your probably feedback. Not. We it's prioritize it. It could be three stat or any of my other ones, just that yeah. one stat it asked about. So I've not turned it yeah, on. So you, my weekend project. Right. Nice. I'm glad because uh, I haven't heard anyone else with a four unless they've asked for it, but you will always get an email when uh, when that update comes. And you have the option of, of not updating, I guess. So Yeah. Um, Robert asks or states, I disabled stat sensor during sleep schedule setting and have only the wireless sensor in the bedroom active during sleep time. So after 30 minutes, we'll decide I'm away and go into the away settings. He might have typed that before you clarified. Um, it has to either see your thermal body or it has to see your body motion, one or the other. So if you don't move while sleeping and you have some giant, huge, thick blanket system, then it might not see you. But other than that, it will see you. Yeah, the difference is if you're using follow me, um, it might not see you. So if they're, if it's not picking up movement every 30 minutes um, and an infrared body heat read, then it may tell the system no one's home and go into that setback during the night. Uh, we recommend you use a schedule and you use that participation mode and you manually tell the system to just use the sensor in my bedroom during this period. And regardless of if there's an occupancy read, it's going to use the temperature input at that sensor and, and maintain. Um, Richard asks, is there a wall mount option for these remote sensors? Yeah, yeah, great question, Richard. And this is uh, some of the things that I miss. You know, we usually go through the sensors and the training and show you all the components that are in the box and everything. Um, most people will just use, if I back up here, a little stand that comes on them. Um, so you've got the magnetic stand. You can put this on and just set it on a mantle or a bookshelf or something. You wanna keep it in like the core body range. So like waist to shoulder level, if you can. 
Um, if you do want to put it on a wall, then there's a couple ways to do that. You've got a flat, flush drywall bracket, and you can screw, uh, we give you drywall anchors, so you can put it flat on a wall, but a lot of times it, it looks awkward because you kind of have to put it next to a light switch or something. Uh, so we came out with a, another bracket where you can angle it uh, up or down. So if you did want to kind of put it up in a corner out of the way a little bit more, uh, we give you an angled bracket and um, you, can, you can point it down. So it's still, as long as it's pointed towards like that core body range, it should still pick up people. The biggest thing is, you know, if you put it too high, you might be a degree or two warmer where the sensor is versus where the people are, you know. And you can calibrate um, the temperature read if that's the case too. There's some different options there. But yeah, you, you can put them uh, on the wall or just set them around the house. All right, Mark asks, can Ecobee control an April air humidifier? Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's another reason it's it's so popular in Chicago, at least, is what I've learned. Uh, it's very easy to set it up. You can eliminate the the humidistat. Um, April Air might tell you otherwise, because you know they want to sell thermostats and humidistats. But uh, you can run everything right through the Ecobee as long as it's the Ecobee four or now the new Smart Pro, the five. The three light model doesn't have dry contacts for an accessory. Yeah. Um, and then on that note, um, it'll control any brand of humidifier. As long as the humidifier is an on off type controlled humidifier, no problem. If you had some kind of weird humidifier where there's a modulating thing or something, no, but that's not a normal scenario. A normal humidifier is just on off. It boils down to a contact and it'll control any brand of that. Uh, right. Brian asks if you have smart home away setting on and the eco plus on max, Will it go beyond the away setting for the max savings if you are not home? Yeah, so um, if you have smart home and away on, that's part of Eco Plus. So you can disable uh, just the setback. You can disable Eco Plus altogether because within Eco Plus, you've got other things like uh, daily utility rates, peak energy times throughout the day where it's going to precondition. You've got a feels like feature where it's going to say, okay, if it's 74, but the humidity in the home is low, it feels more like 72, so we're not gonna kick on the air. Um, so you can turn just the setback feature off uh, or all of it off, but if you're using Smart Home in a way and um, you're, you're cranking it up to a max, it's gonna go quite a bit further than what your scheduled set point is because it's gonna try to get you the max amount of savings off your bill. Now, you might have to wait longer than a half an hour for the system to get back to temperature to recover. All right, Ferris uh, asks, uh, if you want to practice on the setup or show customer features, is there a simulated link for that? I think he's talking about something similar to the simulator you're showing on your computer right now, if there's something like that that other people can use. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, and I get that a lot. And uh, the answer is, we don't share the simulator uh, file. You know, it's it's a file. Uh, technically, we have the ability to to share it, but we don't like to because if the software were to fall in the wrong hands of one of our competitors, um, that could become a problem. So we're working on a solution there. Um, we get the question a lot, Ferris, so I appreciate it. And I think what we ideally want to do is have like a web-based simulator where you could go out to a website and do everything that I'm showing you here. Uh, but as far as giving you the file, it, it's a no-go. We just can't do it. Yeah. Yeah, the web simulator would be great. Some of the other stats I play with on the actual app of the stat, there's a demo button. So even if you don't have a login, you download the app and you can press demo and then basically navigate all the, the homeowner related type features, which is kind of helpful. Um, yeah, that would be nice too. Um, the approach we've always taken is, you know, if you ever need a, a 24 volt transformer, I have a bunch of them in my car Yeah. and I can always just get you like a two wire transformer and a demo unit and you can just plug it in and use that as a live demo, just kind of take it around to customers or something. If, if you need exactly. To and then like Pete mentioned in the, in the live classes, when we do this, that's what we do. We power them up on the table and, and go through all the settings. Obviously, we can't do that today, but that's what we would do in a live class. 
Right. Um, Jim has a statement that uh, with the humidifier control, you cannot have it turn the humidifier on by itself. Um, you can do that. There actually is a feature where the thermostat can force the humidifier on and force the fan on based on a humidity call alone and not have a heating call. So you actually can do that, Jim. Yeah, I can show you that real quick. If you go into your equipment and we'll just reconfigure real quick. And this is what's great about a webinar. We don't always have the ability to, to get into these details. Um, so I'm gonna say, uh, just to eliminate some of the extra steps, we'll take a heat pump off. But uh, if we're running a humidifier here, when you set it up, what Ryan was talking about, um, you know, one wire versus two wires gonna depend on if the humidifier has its own internal power source. So basically if you plug it into uh, to the wall or if you need to power it off the board. Um, but either way, you'll have this step in here when you get to the humidifier, um, evaporative or steam. And I don't know if it was necessarily intentional, but the, the only difference in the software is that if you use the steam setting, it's, it's gonna allow you to condition to meet the humidity set point um, without a heat call. So, and Ryan, you can probably explain this better than me, but if you're using the steam setting, like you always say, just use steam, because if you choose evaporative, it'll only kick on the accessory or the humidifier when the heat is engaged, right? And if you use steam, it's only, uh, it'll kick the fan and the humidifier on regardless of whether there's a heat call, right? Correct, there's no other difference in the software setting other than the ability to turn the fan on or not turn the fan on on a humidity call. So the wording, the feature's cool, the wording of it's poor. Yeah, we, okay. um, we, we probably need to do a better job of kind of calling that out in these screens. Uh, and that's why I feel like maybe it wasn't intentional, but it does work as long as you use steam, right? All right, well, around okay. the humidifier thing, uh, Oscar has a question. If you have five wires in the wall, could you use the PEK kit to get an extra sixth wire so you have an extra, extra one for the humidifier? Obviously, the answer to that is yes. The humidifier would get one of the dedicated wires um, and then you would make do the, the other four would be would handle your five, if you will. So yes, you can do that. Yeah. So this is um, like a diagram of that PEK. This is always going to go down by your furnace board. And um, if you do have that extra wire, you can save yourself uh, the need to to run the common direct to the thermostat. So you're going to repurpose your fan wire from this module, run it in the common. You also have to use your first stage cool as PEK here. But uh, yeah, you can absolutely, you can take that extra fifth wire and run it direct into your accessory terminal, which isn't on this diagram. You would see like ACC plus and minus here and you could do that and that would work no problem. Yep. Uh, on the humidifier wiring topic, Andrew asks if you can use the contact on the stat to run a 220 volt uh, humidifier um, or if you're limited to 24 volts. Yes, you're limited to 24 volts, but you could put a relay in between those if you needed to, Andrew. But you definitely cannot hook 220 up to the thermostat. Yeah, that would be Let's see, Peter says, with customers having bypass or powered humidifiers and want to run it independent of the heat, I have to set it to steam humidifier mode to run the humidifier independent of the heat and thermostat to control the fan. Yes, correct. You have to tell it you have a steam humidifier even though you don't. Right. Uh, in fact, I program them all for steam humidifier no matter what. And then later on in the steam humidifier setup, you could choose if you want it to be able to force the fan on or force it to wait for a heat call. You can pick. Right, exactly. All right. Uh, I don't understand Andrew's question. He's saying he's got a boiler and a Unico system with a humidifier, but the humidifier works in the test mode, um, but he has to change the setting for steam humidifiers. This is normal? No, Andrew, it's not normal for it to only work in the test mode, um, but maybe the humidity in your space is too high to kick it on. Um, yeah. Probably it. Um, you you just have to crank up the humidity des desired humidity set point or desired humidity level. You probably just have to increase it. 
Uh, Jerry asks, does the, hum does the ecobee sense humidity? Yeah, the, um, the three light or the five, so both current models will give you a humidity read at thermostat. Um, so it you know shows up right on the home screen here. You'll see humidity here on either. The difference is you've got to use the four or the smart thermostat, um, the, the latest, to actually control it. So you can't wire a humidifier into the thermostat unless it's the four or the five, but you can see the humidity on any model. Right. So even the Ecobee 3 Lite, where you can read the humidity but not control a humidifier, you could actually still use that to do the cool to dehumidify functionality where it forces the compressor on to dehumidify. That would still work on an equal B3 light, but like pizza, it would. the wire up for right. a positive humidity. Yeah, we call it AC over cool max. Um, I know Carrier calls it something different, um, but yeah, same thing. I think they call it over cool to dehumidify. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, really creative. Details. Uh, if you guys didn't know the, the Carrier core original and the Bryant housewife stats are made by Ecobee. So there's a lot of overlap in what they do, but there are some differences between them and, and some of the naming of the features is some of the differences. Um, uh, Robert asks, is there a max range for Wi-Fi signals? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I can't exactly answer like distance wise. Uh, I've had it explained to me from some experts that your Wi-Fi signal is is sort of like uh, water. <laughs> it's kind of weird to think about, but if you picture like you got your router in a closet and uh, you fill that closet up with water, well, the water can't really escape very far, so it's gonna it's gonna knock your range down. If you've got your router out in an open space like a living room, uh, it's definitely gonna increase the distance between you know where you put the thermostat in in relation to the router. So it's going to vary. Um, it's really tough to say. And, and there's different settings in the Wi-Fi where you can extend the distance. And I'm just not the expert on it. All right. Well, we've had a lot of good questions. Thank you guys for that. Keep them coming. Um, we're going to let Pete get back to the slides for a while, or we're never going to we're never going to get through them all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, this is great. I love all the questions, guys. Um, so. I talked about Eco Plus, you know, a little bit. Um, I, the one thing I should mention here is if you're using this, you're going to get a monthly email, which is nice. It's like a scheduling assistant, and it's going to look for inconsistencies in the occupancy data. So where Nest is saying we're learning your schedule, we're learning your behavior, we're saying we're using the sensors to see when you're home, when you're not, and if your schedule says you should be home, but you're not there. So, for example, every Tuesday last month, uh, you had it set up where you were going to be away, but you were actually home because coronavirus hit and you can't leave your house. So um, you'll get an assistant email from Ecobee once a month, and it's going to say, we recommend you adjust your schedule to say that you are home Tuesday because we've noticed you're always home on Tuesday and you're saying you should be gone. So that's sort of the uh, artificial intelligence or the learning piece for us. What's nice is we're not just gonna randomly adjust the set point or your preferences. We're gonna always kind of ask for permission and we're gonna recommend it, but we won't just kind of take over your comfort level in the home. Um, that's kind of what Nest does and that's what people don't like about it sometimes. Um, so big difference between us. Um, the homes feature is relatively new. We already touched on this earlier, but homes just means if you've got a vacation home, um, like, I wish I had this problem. I don't have a lake house or anything, uh, but like my in-laws, you know, they've got a condo down in Florida. They've got a lake house up in Wisconsin. Um, they, they love this. So my, my father-in-law can use it um, to monitor each location and you can group the thermostats within each address. Um, you can invite other family members to join and control those devices. So if you, just add a, an email address through your app. You, you go to the invite option, it's right on the home screen. And it'll send them an email. It'll say, please create an account. Now, you know, however you designate their control through each address, they can control those devices as well. Um, the difference is you can actually set up like unique 
schedules and comfort settings for each user. Um, probably the best way to do it is like with the geofence option. So this is something we, uh, we never really played with before, but I think it's cool because uh, let's say, you know, I go up to my in-laws place in Wisconsin and I don't want the air on. I want the windows open. Uh, I can set it up where my preference is, you know, uh, don't kick the AC on based on my phone geofencing. So when I get within range of the house, it's going to know it's, it's Pete. It's not my father-in-law. It's going to use a different set of comfort settings. Uh, when he goes up there, he might want the AC to crank down to 68 degrees when he arrives. And um, you can manage it that way. So each individual can kind of have their own setup based on their, their geofence location, based on their phone, their profile. Um, pretty neat. Uh, definitely something that I think Ecobee's focused on overall is just kind of making the overall experience nicer for people and, and automatically managing some of these things without thinking about it. So, so this, is, this is a big piece of that. Um, <clears throat> our, uh, to continue on the software topic, so our portal, you know, the residential portal, we, we use Home IQ, and this is available to the homeowner. They need a bigger display to see it. So you've got to be on a laptop. You've got to be on a tablet. Um, ideally, like an iPad is probably the best way to, to view this. You can go out, go onto your app or log in at ecobee.com. And as the homeowner, you can go back 15 months. I think it's still 15 months. They temporarily, they shortened it, but um, it's, it's over a year. You can kind of go back and look at the history of your runtime. So you can see five minute intervals. Every time the, um, the system calls for heat, cool. Whenever the fan's running, if you've got a humidifier, it's going to graph out uh, your, your humidifier runtime. It's going to show uh, humidification. So if you switch over from temperature to humidity, it'll graph out in the home what the humidity level is, your indoor temp, your outdoor temp. It shows you a lot of data here. Um, what's nice for you guys on the phone as a contractor is you can view this same information on your side through the contractor portal. You can use the Ecobee version. You can use the Carrier Bryant Connects. Um, I think the main difference is, you know, if you want to see all different thermostats in one place. So if you're, you've already installed some core thermostats, you've got maybe some infinity or evolution stats out there that you're monitoring and you want to see Ecobee, you're better off using the Carrier version. If you're just doing Ecobee and you only want to track Ecobees, you can use our portal. You just can't really use uh, both of them with the same serial number. So you kind of have to pick one or the other. Uh, but either way, you see this runtime data. Pete, Pete, um, Pete just yeah, to go ahead. you can use the same, you can use multiple portals with the same serial number of the customer portals. You just can't do it with the dealer portals. So like right now okay. I have my carrier stats, my Brian stats and my Ecobee stats all on my Ecobee portal and they're all on my carrier portal and they're all on my Brian portal. In fact, it's the same login. So once you create a, a login on one portal, it's the same for all three portals for the customer portal. But on the dealer portal, you have to pick one lane or the other lane. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Definitely. Yeah. So we're talking really the benefit to the contractors will be the dealer portal. Correct. So we use wow. the word port portal so much and there's like multiple portals. So people get a little tripped up sometimes. Uh, yeah. Add that there are pros and cons to the two carrier versus Ecobee portals um, for the customer even. Um, so like, for example, you really don't see anything with the remote sensors when you go to the carrier portal because they don't know anything about remote sensors. Um, Right. Apps. However, the phone app you cannot mix and match. If you if you have mix, if someone has mixed thermostats, you cannot do it that way. Hardly any customers have both carrier and Ecobee stats. So if you have a customer like that, I'd say just reach out to me and I'll tell you what you can and can't do so you know what to offer them. It's a little bit weird. Yeah. Good advice. No, you're right. I, I think it's more distributor uh, contacts that are kind of using both, but yes. most homeowners probably not. Yeah. Correct. So the other nice feature about the contractor portal, you know, if you're using the dealer portal, the contractor portal, um, you log that serial number, 12 digits. Um, you know, 
it'll tie your company information based on the profile on the account in the portal and it will pull up your company name and your phone number whenever there's a problem potentially uh, so if you want to see a log of the homeowner uh, at their thermostat you can see that log in the portal you can get emails for each alert each reminder uh, and it will be hard coded into the thermostat so you're you're kind of always tied to that customer or that device through the software as long as you're using that that option and it's totally free the um we don't charge for the for the pro contractor portal or anything um you just kind of need that profile set up um ecobee like any of us uh, in the field can get that done for you contact me contact our customer uh, inside sales support team and we'll get that done and uh, and then you'll automatically have that information just pop up on, on your homeowner stat so. um i guess if we have the opportunity i can kind of show you guys how this looks Let's see if this works My internet has been very slow because I think all my neighbors are stuck inside in their house working. <laughs> so everything in the area is slowed down. Yeah. Uh, so this might not work today, but. That, especially if you have cable, that's been definitely an issue. Um, yeah, it's, while it's that's crazy. loading, I'm gonna ask you questions. Um, Emmanuel asks, if you have two phones for geofencing, how do you let them know which phone to go with for the geofencing? So it will um, it will always default back to whoever originated that account. Um, so you've kind of got like the original uh, account owner is sort of like the master, I guess. And then each uh, each family member that they would invite would be uh, like second tier. So it's gonna you're gonna have di different preferences and comfort settings based on. The device that's in range, um, but there's going to be a level of sort of priority based on who owns the account, if that makes sense. Uh, one more. Uh, Peter asks Does Ecobee have a recommended time the fan only mode should run without a heat and cool call in that hour time frame? Do we have a recommended fan run time? I think he's talking about where you can program the fan to run X minutes out of the hour, anywhere between five and 55 minutes. I think he's talking oh, about okay, yeah. recommended setting for that. If not, I have recommendations, but. Yeah, I would say, you know, go with yours, Ryan, because I don't think we really have a recommendation. Um, it might be in here. Let me see. Yeah, so there, there's a lot of different opinions on that, and the answer will be different for different homes and why you're even running the fan continuously or partially. So there's the code answer. Sometimes the building code requires a certain amount of CFM uh, per hour or even on a four hour time block uh, that you have to bring in for fresh outside air. So if you have that situation, let's say your house by code needs 100 CFM and you put a 200 CFM inlet system in, then you have to run it 30 minutes out of the hour. So sometimes codes are gonna force you to pick the number that way. The other things that come up are sometimes you may want to run the fan because you want to get more air circulation. And usually that's because you're trying to get more air to go through your filter, or if you have an air purification device. So a lot of people, myself included right now, have beefed up the amount of time that you run the fan because we're trying to do a better job of keeping the air cleaner because we're all freaked out right now. Uh, plus I have six <laughs> people in my house that normally all wouldn't be there at the same time that are all packed in. Um, the other thing to consider is that if you have duct work that goes into unconditioned spaces like crawl spaces and attics, it is probably 25 to 35% leaky based on DOE test data, which means that if you run the fan continuously, 30 some percent of your air getting sucked in your return duct is coming from your attic, which is freaking hot in the summer, or your crawl space, which is moldy and mildewy and humid and stuff. So if you have leaky duct work, which most people do, running the fan actually might be energy penalty and or comfort penalty to you. So the answers right. all depend on what the situation is and why you're running the fan and how crappy your duct work is. 
much better answer than I could have given. <laughs> uh, Thank you. On that note, it says Carrier recommends to run the ECM motors 24/7. Can the fan run 24/7? Uh, Carrier does not recommend we run the ECM motors 24/7. I'm not sure where that recommendation is coming from. Maybe it was a specific person. Um, but yes, you could run the fan 24/7 if you want to. Uh, if you want to do that with Ecobee, your choices are to. It's kind of weird because like you can't walk up to the stat and tell it you want to run the fan nonstop. At least I don't think you can. But on the portal, you can do that. Um, so you can either go to the portal and click on fan on if you have the stat in the hold mode, or you can go to your schedules from the phone app, the stat, or the portal and have your schedules run the fan during your home or away or whatever periods uh, and do mm. it that way. Or you can just tell the uh, timer to run the stat, run the fan 55 minutes out of the hour. Uh, but we don't have any recommendations from Carrier that are suggesting you should run ECM motors 24-7. It, it depends on the application. Okay. Great. Uh, Andrew does also add that if you have a UV light, uh, that you would need to run the fan 24-7. You do not. Uh, the UV light has no bearing on the fan. The UV light's job, and its only job, is to shine on the evaporator coil and kill stuff on the coil and the drain pan. It is not related to airflow at all. However, if you happen to have like a PCO device that has a UV light in it, in that case, yes, you would need the fan to run for those, uh, but you don't need it to run 24-7. It could be running intermittent and you could still get the similar benefits to that. All right, let's get back on track. Sounds good. Um, so this is the contractor portal, and this is just sort of a demo account we use. Um, in theory, your, your company information is going to be listed here. Uh, so this is going to be the info that pops up on the thermostat as far as how to contract, uh, how to contact your contractor, tongue twister. Um, but you know, people forget who their HVAC guy is. So if they go a couple of years and they don't have an issue, all of a sudden they, um, they have a problem where the furnace stops working and it's going to come up in, in the form of an alert here. Um, you can see from your side, every thermostat that you've tracked. So it's going to just list them out here on the side. And you'll also see a map view, which is just not loading just because of my internet speed. But um, if I go into one of these, you know, maybe <clears throat> look at Rebecca here, should be able to see a history of all those alerts. So this is just a reminder to service your HVAC equipment. Uh, here's a high humidity alert, right? So every time this, pops up, it's going to come up at the thermostat, it's going to send the homeowner an email, you can see it on your side as well. And then you can also see you've got this HVAC report option. So she didn't give me permission, uh, maybe Daniel did. Um, <laughs> bad example, let's try Stuart, Stuart's our, uh, our CEO. Yeah, so Stuart, he gave us permission, we can see the history of this runtime here. So we can kind of go through and we can see all that data graphed out in the, the customer's home. So pretty cool. Um, just a quick you know, overview of how that looks. You, unfortunately, you're not seeing the map here. Uh, but if I were to go back out, just log out here, I can show you guys. <clears throat> I don't want to offend anybody, but um, it should show in my residential portal who my local contractor is and you can go in you can change who that contractor is you can change what they want to view so or what they're able to view you know alerts reminders runtime the homeowner kind of has the final consent and um and can control who the contractor is and what they can see uh and that's going to be you know if i were to go into my personal one here um you would see it And we should see all of my devices listed out here. It's just got awfully slow, but uh, <clears throat> once these load, we'll go into, you know, whichever thermostat, I've got all my demo stats kind of linked here. But if I go like, this is the, the thermostat running my boiler, um, I go into the about section 
and then I've got my contractor here, right? So this is gonna pull up a list based on every contractor in the area that has an account set up with us. So uh, kind of like a preferred Ecobee uh, professional out there. These guys, House of Heat, they're right down the street from me. This is my closest HVAC company. So if I wanted to choose them, say, okay, next time there's an issue, um, I want that House of Heat company to be notified. You know, maybe I'm down in Florida on vacation, temperature in my home's 45 degrees. I'm gonna save this. Now it's gonna ask, okay, what do I want my contractor to see? Do I want them to see that runtime data? Do I want them to see uh, alerts and reminders? Or maybe I don't want them to see either, right? But I still wanna know who my contractor is. This is the kind of thing uh, you can control through the residential side. As long as the pro has logged their 12 digit serial number, uh, they're gonna be able to have that visibility, so. Um, Ryan, I'll just kind of keep moving along here so we can cruise yep. through. Yep, perfect. So with, as far as differences between the models and kind of what's new with the thermostats, um, the Smart Thermostat Pro, AKA the five, Got two stages, heat and cool on conventional, four stages heat on a heat pump, two auxiliary. You've got the accessory control, so you can only do a humidifier, dehumidifier, ventilator through the thermostat, as long as it's this model. You've got a five-year pro install warranty, so the pro model is a different part number. It's got a P in it. Uh, that means that you've always got an additional two years minimum warranty over any other channel. So if you go retail, go buy it at Best Buy, uh, they're going to pay more. They're also going to get a three-year warranty. Um, you know, Costco, for example, they might be selling the old generation. So like Costco, you might still see the Ecobee 4, which we phased out last summer. Um, they might carry that. They're going to offer a 12-month warranty. They're going to get a good price, but they're not going to have that warranty. They're not going to have the support from their contractor. Um, so, you know, a lot of people ask about Costco. We really use Costco to liquidate our old models and, and the stuff we really don't support any longer. Um, so five year with the Pro, always the latest and greatest. You've got the speaker built in and you've got an extra sensor that comes in the box. Um, the three light, the big difference, still get two stages on conventional, it's two auxiliary with a heat pump. Uh, you don't have the auxiliary uh, dry contacts, so there's no uh, plus and minus accessory control. Um, you don't have the speaker, so there's no smart speaker built in, no Amazon Echo, and there's no sensor in the box, but you can pair sensors separately, up to 32 of them. You just buy them in, uh, in a two-pack. Something that's new, um, so here's uh, one of the gentlemen earlier was asking about the adapter plate. This is, uh, this is it. This is the latest uh, spec here. So this was the original prototype we were kind of playing around with out in the field. Uh, this is a unique problem in Chicagoland. So it's code here. You know, you have to mount into a junction box uh, when there's an inspection involved, single gang, to, uh, dual gang. That's the requirement. Uh, it's the requirement in certain cities across the country, you know, areas with dense populations, New York, South Florida, uh, San Francisco, you know, areas like that, this is going to be building code. Uh, we've never had our own plate. A lot of guys have gotten creative and come up with their own solution. We had some homemade in a machine shop in, uh, up near McHenry, but um, they didn't work great. So this one, this one will work vertically, horizontally, single gang, dual gang. It's got this recessed groove. Uh, so whether you're using the trim plate or not, uh, this will sit nice flush uh, and it'll it'll look a lot cleaner than some of the solutions you guys have come up with in the past. So um, the plan is start rolling this out this quarter. Uh, TEC would have access to bring in, you know, maybe they have to bring in a 25 pack or something. Uh, the, the goal is that the cost to the contractor is going to be cheap. You know, they're not going to cost much. Um, very similar kind of to, to what Nest offers. Uh, the other thing, along with, you know, rolling out this trim plate with commercial applications, we've got a lot coming in the, the form of a software update. So there will be a new software version that gets uh, preloaded on, on every pro and builder uh, SKU coming from the plant. And when you fire up, you know, you first boot up the, the thermostat, it will ask, 
you know, are you a contractor? Are you a homeowner? And if you choose contractor, it's going to take you into some other screens you've never seen before. And it will, it will give you the ability to repurpose some of these extra terminals. Um, so you'd be able to run in like a three speed fan, right? So up to three, you've got your G1, your G2, your G3. If it's a high rise fan coil setup, now you've got the ability to uh, utilize those second stage terminals for a second and third uh, fan speed. So like high, medium, low. Well. Um, if you're running a PTAC, right? So like hotels, those window units, pretty common. This is gonna give us the ability to control those now. Um, even like with high rise heat pump setups, uh, two pipe, four pipe fan coils, uh, this will really open the door. Uh, we'll even have an option for S1 and S2 input. So if, uh, if you've got someone on an Aquastat setup, uh, you'll be able to utilize these terminals for, uh, for temperature input as well. So, so pretty cool. Um, any questions on that? Uh, the question is, will the adapter plate come in the box with the stack? No, we don't plan on putting it in the box, but um, it shouldn't cost more than a few bucks. You know, you just buy it separate as an accessory. Well, now I think about it, the way he worded it, maybe he meant a junction box. It says, it says, will the adapter plate come with the box? I don't know what that means. Maybe he means the junction box. No, it won't come with a junction box. Yeah, this would be a unique design that Ecobee would make. Um, you know, you can go to an electrical distributor and you can find they've got a lot of different similar type things you can use. Um, but we wanted to have our own because guys have been asking for this for years. Uh, so I'm excited that we finally have a solution, you know. We have two questions about the contractor portal. One was, how does the contractor register to use the Ecobee portal? Just get a hold of me, uh, peter.w at ecobee.com. You, uh, you can also go to our website and there's an inside sales contact. It's like inside sales at ecobee.com. Um, and we can just create that account for you. We just need your company information and contact info. And it's pretty simple. And then we'll, we'll even set up like an hour or so to kind of walk you through, uh, through a webinar or like show you how everything functions in the portal. The other portal question was, uh, does the Ecobee contractor portal have any costs associated with it for you to add your customers? No, it's totally free. Uh, we, we don't plan on charging for it. We never have. Uh, we're probably going to revamp it and make it, you know, just look a little more updated, a little more modern look and feel, but uh, there's no cost. Um, Ferris asks, where specifically on the thermostat is the temperature sensor? Uh, so it's going to be um, back here. So it's going to be on the on the back side um, on on the three light, and then I believe um, on the screen here. I don't know exactly on the three light. This is the same. This little kidney bean. You can't really see it, but this is the same sensor that's built into the room sensor. So it's it's located in a different place. Uh, depending on which model, but I think the three light is mounted in the back of it. I think he was talking, yeah, I think he was talking about the temperature sensor. So you're saying the temperature sensor is behind the motion sensor or built into the motion sensor on the stat? It's all in one? The little kidney bean, that's my understanding is that the temperature and occupancy are uh, in here. Uh, Andrew asks, do we have to notify the homeowner of the portal? I'm assuming he means the contractor portal. Yeah, um, you just need to have the homeowner go in and choose your company. They'd have to log in through a laptop and they would just have to make sure and pick your information here. Um, and that gives you the consent to see the data in their home. So you don't really have to do anything from a liability standpoint on top of that. Uh, if you go back, can you go back to that, what, what my contractor can see tab? Sure. They just had on the, on the, uh, yeah. So for you guys right. that do the Bryant and Carrier contractor portal, you can add the customer stat to those portals with just the serial number alone and no permission from the customer, but you don't really see anything. You just see the customer's name, basically. 
Uh, the customer then has to still check these boxes like they would have had to check if they were setting up for an Ecobee contractor instead of a carrier contractor. Um, otherwise, you're not going to see anything. It's just, this is who my customer is, great, but you won't be able to see any of their data, like their temperature settings or anything. So you guys are helping customers out. Make sure they check these boxes, otherwise it's useless or nearly useless. And that makes sense because it's their stat, like they should have to be able to be the ones giving you permission or taking your permission away. Uh, Andrew asks, can the contractor make any adjustments remotely or is it view only? It is uh, it is view only. Um, it's a privacy issue if we, if we were to give control um, just like, you know, you can see occupancy, but you can only see a few days instead of over a year, like the homeowner. Um, so through the contractor portal, you, you don't have the ability to control anything. It's just a, a monitoring tool. But I suppose if, um, you know, I hear stories that homeowners want their contractor to have control because they're, they're down in Florida for four months or something. Um, they can use that, that um, multiple user feature in the app and invite their contractor and have the contractor have their own account and control that way. Um, just not through the contractor. Uh, Jill asks if Ecobee has any advertising materials that they can customize. I'm assuming she wants to take your materials and add her uh, logo and phone number and website to them, I'm assuming. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Let me, uh, can you get Jill's contact info and I can yep. get in touch with her, Ryan? Yep, we have her info. So on the final report, we'll have her info on there. Yep. Yeah, I, I, we can do some things for sure. Um, I just probably have to talk to our marketing guys to kind of figure that out. Uh, Nick asks, does Ecobee work with iHome app? iHome. Um, that, is that the Google I app? I don't know. I think that's the Google one. Isn't it? No. Uh, I don't know what I have. So, I home audio speakers. When I Google it, that's what I get. A bunch of speakers. Oh, the speakers. Um, let me see, because the the answer to that is really gonna be in the Alexa integration. So we can kind of cover that real quick before we um, run out of time here. But I home, you know, if I were to go into my uh, Amazon Alexa app on on my phone and I go to the skills section, any manufacturer with a skill for Alexa um, would, would be compatible. So it looks like, like they've got an iView iHome app where there's like an iHome smart plug control, iHome music. Um, as long as you go into your app and enable that skill, it would allow through the Alexa interface, you'd have to be using the Amazon speaker and over voice, you would be able to, in theory, push audio to that speaker or maybe use that platform to control lights or something like that. So it's all dependent on if there's a skill in Amazon. Uh, Peter's asking, uh, what about hooking up a boiler to the new thermostats? Right now he's installing a fan center relay to get it to work. Uh, maybe. Maybe you need to tell us what the fan center really is doing, but in general, you just wire R and W from the Ecobee to the TT terminal on the boiler or the boiler control, whatever you have, uh, and then run a third common wire or use a common wire splitter and you're done. Um, I'm not sure why you're using the fan center relay. If it's for something else, that's fine, but this would wire no different than any other thermostat other than you need a common wire. Right. Um, You want me to touch on the smart home stuff real quick, Ryan? Kind of what's new or? Uh, yeah, please. So yeah, I think this is always important to mention. So I'm just gonna back up a slide or two here. Um, with the Smart Thermostat Pro, we get a lot of questions about like, what can you do and can't you do with it? And what's different? Um, you've got that Amazon voice control built in. So as long as you're using Amazon as your like smart home platform or ecosystem, you can talk to the thermostat It'll play music. Um, the coolest feature that, that's new is probably the phone. 
So I use this a lot now because uh, I've got little kids who do not have phones. They don't have their own smartphone yet. And they can call family members through this. They can't call the police because that's not a feature that Amazon has, um, has set up. So you don't have to worry about them contacting authorities, but it'll pull your contacts in from your, your, your mobile phone through the app as long as you give it permission. And now you've got a free landline on the wall. So a lot of people that have gotten rid of their landline, uh, you put an Ecobee Smart Pro on the wall or a five now, uh, it's got a quad core processor, just like an Apple iPhone. And it's literally a speaker phone on your wall. Doesn't cost you a dime to use it. As long as you have Wi-Fi, um, it's using your Wi-Fi data and it's a voice over IP uh, connection. So it's not gonna actually use your wireless cellular data through AT&T or Verizon or whatever, um, but it will identify who your contacts are from your contact list on your phone. Uh, so pretty nice selling feature, especially those with, uh, with, with younger kids. You know, I've told mine now, if there's an emergency, go up to Alexa, have her call grandma, have her call uh, mom, whatever. Um, the other thing that's neat is you've got a Bluetooth 5.0 chip in here. So just like a smartphone, again, you can stream your music through the thermostat. You can use Spotify now. There's an add-in for Spotify. You can use Amazon. Uh, you can push the music to other devices through Bluetooth. This would be the same thing like with the camera that we talked about. Uh, you'd be able to connect from our Ecobee device to like a Sonos hub, and you can use the speaker to push the specific song you want to hear to that Sonos. Um, you can play surround sound now with, uh, with other Amazon Echoes around the house simultaneously. So, um, so those are really the new features. It's, it's all home automation stuff, really nothing different on the HVAC side. Um, the one thing we always talk about is, you know, if you're using this with Amazon, you get a lot more out of it. You can talk to Alexa through the thermostat. If you don't use Amazon and you're using Google, you've got a, a Google a home speaker or an Apple HomePod, uh, even like Samsung is, is getting pretty popular as far as using like the Samsung SmartThings app to control all your devices. We don't restrict the, the homeowner. They can pick and choose whichever platform, whichever devices they want, and, and they can integrate the Ecobees on just about any smart home platform that's out there. So. Um, I think we can probably just kind of roll through the PEK. We talked about this already, but just to quickly recap, R is gonna go into RC always. If you just have one power wire, always go into RC and not RH. Doesn't matter if you're using the add wire or not. Uh, when you are using the add wire, you're gonna repurpose your, your G, your fan as your common, and your Y into this PEK terminal. So when the PEK terminal is activated, it's telling the thermostat, hey, we're short of wire, and um, you know, we need to maintain a constant connection through the module here. It's gonna just basically jump back and forth, depending on which equipment's running, depending on if there's a heat call or a cool call. Um, the other thing to remember is this is always down by the equipment. So you've got four coming in, five coming out here. Everything's nicely labeled, just adds that common. And then this is a close up. So again, G to C, Y to PEK. If you have a dual transformer set up with a boiler, you know, boiler air handler combo, you can run into both power um, terminals. That's okay. If you just have one power wire, it's gotta be RC for the thermostat to turn on. Um, and then the last point here, guys, and I'm willing to hang on as long as you want and answer questions. We're just about out of time. But smart buildings, um, we always want to just mention this is another option out there. With residential, you're limited to about 16 devices per account. Um, with smart buildings, there's no limit. You can have as many users, as many thermostats, as many buildings listed out on here as you want. The other cool thing is on the residential side, you can only use a residential Ecobee model. You can't use a commercial model. Uh, with smart buildings, you can use any Ecobee model that we've ever made. So it doesn't matter if it's a commercial thermostat, a residential thermostat, you can connect all of them in one account 
and maintain full control over all of your locations from just one spot. Uh, there's a mobile app, you got like mobile push notifications. If there's an alert that are gonna pop up on the phone, you're gonna see everything listed out here on your home screen. Uh, you can quickly go in and you can bulk filter. You can add custom filter uh, tags is what we call it. So, you know, for example, if you've got a, a distribution company or something and you only wanna change the, the set point for the office space, you can add a tag for every thermostat that's in an office and you can quickly filter out, okay, these 20 office thermostats I wanna change, the other 30 thermostats that are, that are in the warehouse areas, we're gonna leave alone. You know, you, you can do a lot of different things like that. Uh, just there's more you can control and there's more you see as far as uh, runtime, sensor data, um, bulk updates, you know, there, there's just more value in using this if you're a commercial company. So, um, so it's just another option out there for users. If if you come across like a light commercial application where maybe they've got 10 or 12 different stores spread out throughout an area, uh, they would be able to use the Smart Buildings platform and, and have a nice enterprise control solution. So um, some of the success stories we've had, just more kind of what, what's ideal, maybe what's not property and vacation rental companies, low-income housing, like I talked about earlier, um, military or student housing facilities, restaurants. We're in uh, a lot of Sprint wireless stores. We're in uh, a lot of retail, like Reebok, Adidas. We're in fast food, Burger King, Taco Bell. Even, um, you know, one that we always talk about is Ruby Tuesday restaurants. We're in all of those, um, a lot, a lot of churches in um, any like municipality or government. So I just wanted to make sure and roll through that guys. Um, that's about all I've got. Uh, happy to hang on here and answer more questions if you want. I've been answering most of them by typing them in because I wasn't sure how much time we'd have. Um, so right now I think we are caught up on questions. Uh, someone did ask what the difference was between the pro and the standard versions of the stat. And the only difference is the longer warranty and obviously it's professionally installed, but the features of the stat are the same. Features of the stat are the same. Um, yeah, you're gonna start seeing some differences in the software, I believe, between retail and pro, like that three-speed fan option and things I, I talked about. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, the functionality is pretty much identical. Here's just some general Go ahead. support. Well, I was just going to say on the screen here, for those of you still on, um, make sure just maybe take a screenshot of this or write down that email address uh, for general support. Uh, again, it's peter.w at ecobee.com for me. Um, inside sales is going to be the group to go to for more of your general like contractor portal requests or just general questions. They can always help. So. Anything else, Ryan? Uh, nope, I think we are caught up and we're pretty close to our time. As a reminder for you guys that uh, registered with your Nate ID and actually logged into the webinar, um, Ecobee will be applying your Nate hours directly through Nate, so you don't have to take any action in that regard other than check in a few weeks from now to make sure everything went through like it was supposed to. If you did not use your Nate number one registering, then in the next few days, you need to either get that to Pete or myself Otherwise, eventually at some point, it becomes hard to, to retroactively get you your hours. And if you don't need Nate, yeah. then don't worry about anything I just said. <laughs> there you go. All right, I think we're all caught up, so I think we're all done. Um, Pete, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I learned some new stuff today too, so that made it fun for me. And uh, maybe we'll have you back again to do another more uh, in-depth session on a few of the programming functions. Sounds great, Ryan. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for having me, and thanks to all those out there that joined. Really appreciate the uh, the support from all you guys, and and contact me anytime with with any questions or issues. All right, we'll see ya. Thanks. See ya.